And now your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening and welcome to our annual holiday edition of It's a Miracle. Once again, we put together some very special stories that we feel represent the true spirit of the season, each of them filled with love, hope, and goodwill toward all. We begin with a story that takes a dramatic and unexpected turn on Christmas Eve, 1996. In 1996, Barbara Listinick was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with her constant companion, Boris. I got Boris when he was two years old. He is the most lovable dog in the whole wide world. He knows when I'm happy, he knows when I'm sad. He's a very big part of my life. I don't have children, I'm not married, so he's like my child and my best friend. Just before Christmas, Barbara made arrangements to move to Brooklyn, New York by renting a moving van, but decided to send Boris via air freight to spare him the long drive. Boris had never flown before, so I was very scared. I did everything that I thought was necessary for safe travels and what the airline recommended as well. That included removing Boris's identification collar so that it wouldn't get snagged during the flight. With that done, Boris was sent on his way. Good boy, Boris. It's okay. My thoughts when Boris was in the air were, please, please, please let him get here safely. But when she arrived at LaGuardia Airport to pick him up, her fears became reality. They took me in back and they said, okay, miss, there's a little bit of a problem. There was an accident. Then he walks me up to a bloody, crunched up, empty carrier. Oh my God, what did you people do? Oh my God, where is he? Where is he? Where's Boris? I knew that they dropped him or drove something into him. And my immediate thoughts were like, my God, is he alive or dead? I just, I just froze, I started shaking, I'm crying, and I'm like, my God, what, what happened? What did you do to Boris? Where is he? Where's Boris? Spotted him on the tarmac. The supervisor told me that Boris had been running around on the tarmac and they have their cargo crew personnel chasing him right now. I said, you're never going to get him. I said, he's, he's scared to death. I said, that's crazy. I said, just let me go out there one whistle and he'll come running to me. Why? Please, the supervisor me insisted that they had the situation under control. And for the next two hours, Barbara waited anxiously for some word of her injured dog. The supervisor finally came back out. The last we've seen him, he was running through the tarmac, and it seems that he's crossed the fence over the highway. He was seen running over the overpass and into Corona, Queens. And I just got in the car and just started searching for him immediately. Idiots! Boris was lost somewhere on the eastern edge of Manhattan, and if Barbara didn't locate him quickly, he could end up anywhere in New York City. He's never been in noisy streets. He's never been in New York City. He got dropped like a needle in a haystack. At first, I was looking for his body. And then, some kids said they saw this dog that was tan and white and he was running like a bullet. And I said, oh, that gave me hope. I said, he's alive. Alive, but lost in one of the largest cities in the world. Boris, come here. Searching all night in the rain, in the cold, up and down the streets, calling out his name. On Christmas Eve, I really realized that, okay, <laughs> I'm like this little, little speck of dust in this big city looking for a lost dog. I know he's out there. Please come here. And I never felt so alone in my entire life, and I didn't know what to do. The next morning, Barbara returned to the airport. You lost my dog. Christmas Day, I go to the supervisor, and I said, okay, we have a situation. 
what are we going to do about this? You lost my dog. Yes, Miss Listernick, I'm filling out the form now. And he just reached under the desk and pulled out a baggage claim form and said, this is all that we can do. This is a baggage claim form. I'm sorry, ma'am. Are you telling me my dog is baggage? I, I almost collapsed. My dog is considered baggage? I never knew in a million years that animals were considered luggage and that the law hasn't been changed since 1929. I said, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. My, my dog's not a piece of luggage. He's my baby. He's like my child. I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> Immediately, I ran home and went through my boxes to find pictures of Boris, and I tore out my fax machine and just started running off flyers. She spent the rest of Christmas Day putting up missing dog posters throughout Corona, Queens. That night, Barbara returned home even more exhausted and depressed. How could she possibly celebrate Christmas under these circumstances? I said, I'm not going to light this tree until he's found, and I'm going to keep this tree until he's found. And this tree is not going anywhere until he's found, and it will be lit when I find him. After spending Christmas Day searching for her lost dog, Barbara Listenick realized that the job was too big for just one person, and so she tried a different approach. What's the best way to get the word out that Boris is lost? And I said, okay, let me call, let me call a newspaper. New York Post. Hi, my name is Barbara Listenick. And she found a sympathetic ear in reporter Laura Italiano. Barbara called the New York Post absolutely frantic. Typically, we're busy chasing murders, political corruption. It took a special kind of story for us uh, to get us to care about a little lost dog. And uh, Barbara was the one who made that happen for us. All right, I'll look forward to it. Good. All right. Bye -bye. It turned out that the New York Post loved the Boris story. He is a classic tabloid story. You have a clear-cut villain, this bungling airline, with a very sympathetic victim, a poor dog who had been lost. I think everyone's heart went out to Barbara. This is a woman who did not know New York City, knew no one in town, had this tremendous responsibility to find an animal in completely unfamiliar surroundings. You had to feel for her. You had to worry about her. I couldn't believe how many people responded. I mean, it touched so many people's hearts. We get more now from New York One's Annika Pergamon. Annika? One of those hearts belonged to Paula Forrester, a professional psychic who saw Boris's picture on a television news program. Eve on a flight from Fort Lauderdale. A Port Authority police said that the canine escaped. They did a close-up on his eyes, and there was like, pow! There was a psychic connection. I have worked psychically with animals before. I have never felt such a strong and urgent connection to anything before that point. Paula immediately contacted Barbara. Hello? And she said that she was a psychic. A psychic? And she said that she was getting strong feelings from him and that they were communicating. Well, my first reaction was, was, hey, lady, heck, you're communicating with my dog. Tell him to come home. But I said, look, I don't want a reward. I don't want pay. I just want to get Boris back to you. OK. I, I didn't believe in it, the hocus pocus type stuff. But hey, I just wanted my baby home. I'd love you to come and help. I wasn't going to turn away any volunteers to help find him. OK, and, and it's Paula? OK, great. Thanks a lot. Paula turned out to be more than just a volunteer. She was a force to be reckoned with. She was really, like, doing the legwork, really going out there, getting the flyers out. She was pushing me, and I thought I was the aggressive one. She was like, come on, let's go. You can do it. You can do it. Keep going. Keep going. I knew her dog was alive, and I knew he was desperate to find Barbara again. He was very, very confused and very, very sad. Every time I linked in psychically to Boris, the sadness, the confusion, and the heartache was overwhelming. Boris! Here, boy! Boris! Come here, boy! Come on, Boris! Going
going from neighborhood to neighborhood, we just kept looking every night in the cold. We just never stopped, never stopped. What kept me going was this little dog that had a really big psychic voice that said, please help me. But after days of searching, Barbara's hopes began to fade. New Year's had come and gone, and it was so cold. With the wind chill factor, it was like something insane, like 25 below zero. And all I could do was cry. I just said, how is he surviving? Family and friends were calling saying, Barbara, you have to get on with your life. This is crazy, you know? And some people, oh, it's only a dog. You know, get over it, Barbara, get another one. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you don't understand. You don't understand, there's no closure. I can't live my life knowing that he's out there, he's cold, he's hungry, he's starving. I, I just say, I said, I'm not gonna give up on him. The hunt is on for a dog that escaped from its cage at Lamar. And the media was standing by Barbara's decision. The number that you can call if you have seen him, the number is 1-800. We started running a story a week in the New York Post, and Barbara kept us well-fed with updates. She felt that if the newspaper kept up a steady drumbeat to search for this dog, that, uh, that public attention wouldn't just die down and he wouldn't die out there. Um, really unmourned, unsearched for. He has freckles all on his chest. But all the publicity only produced more false leads. Someone would say, oh, we found a stray, and deep inside I'm like, oh, please, just let it be him. Just let it be him. Please, 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 you know, let, let this misery stop for me. Or if I get a call that it was a dead dog on the side of the road, you know, that's tan and white, I'd go there and then I'd be, oh, God, thank you, thank you, it's not him, it's not him, you know. It was such an emotional roller coaster. I don't know how sometimes I kept going. You know, I was just physically and emotionally exhausted. Luckily, Barbara had Paula Forrester to help keep her spirits up. Her energy just kept me going, and really, it was a godsend that she did come along. The worst thing you can do is get discouraged. I know he's out there. Don't give up. I don't care if it takes two months. I don't care if it takes three months. Your dog is coming home. Alive. <laughs> All the efforts of the public and the media have been unable to produce a single solid lead. But a strange recurring dream is about to change the perimeters of the search. I would dream of Boris in the middle of the night, and I would get images of tires, of the dog sleeping in a tire, of him having a bloody foot, of him starving, of him being very cold. And I knew that I was picking up what the dog was feeling. The dog was freezing. And that was very disturbing to me because I knew how desperate he was. The dream eventually led Paula to an automotive shop in Queens. I must have driven by this one auto repair place that had tires everywhere, that had windshields, that did body repair. I must have driven by it a hundred times. I actually went up and approached one of the workers there. Excuse me, sir. Have you seen this dog? Uh, one ear up, one ear down. He's brown and white. He might look like a stray by now. No, I haven't. He There's, might be like running around here somewhere. There's a lot of strays around here, lady. I'm pretty he, busy. The man was so busy, he just really kind of brushed me off. It seemed like just another dead end. Unfortunately, at this point, the media was also beginning to question its involvement in the search. Maybe we're doing the wrong thing in keeping this story going because the longer time that it had passed, the less likely of a happy ending in this story. When do you say when? When do you say it's enough, give up? I was had to make a decision whether to keep going on with this endless search or get on with my life. It was really getting to the point where, okay, reality started checking in with me. And I said, Barbara, if you give up, this dog's gonna give up and die because the only reason he's staying alive is because he knows you're out there looking for him. After weeks and weeks of searching, Paula received a tip on yet another sighting of Boris. I received a call at my apartment from a man in Queens who said, I think I have the dog that's in the flyer. He says, 
There's been a stray dog living in this garbage-filled, abandoned lot next to my house. Sometimes we throw leftovers over the fence because we feel sorry for this stray dog. And it kind of looks like the picture. The call brought Paula back to a familiar location. The man's apartment was next door to the automotive shop she'd visited days before. The man had let him in the house, walked into his house, looked at the dog, looked at the picture, looked at the dog. His eyes were like soulless. They were dead. They were like a lost soul. He was filthy. He was a different color. He had a slash in his foot almost all the way through. Walked up to him and said, Boris, is that you? And then one ear went up, one ear went down. And I'm like, oh my god, it's Boris after 52 days. Her hands shaking, Paula immediately called Barbara. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hello? I said, Barbara, we have Boris. She's like, it's not my dog. I've, I, you know, I can't go and look at any more dogs. Paula, are you sure, Tim? I'm so tired. I, I don't know how much I can take. Are you sure? Somebody called me. He's inside a house. This is definitely your dog. You have got to come down here now. Paula, I can't go through this. Don't Barbara, there was not one ounce of, of energy left in me to do anything. I was like, God, what, well, you, it, it's not him. It can't be him. Look, I'm telling you, one ear up, one ear down. You've got to come down here. It's only a mile from the airport. OK, I'm on my way. Weeks of sorrow and worry were about to come to an end. Come on, come on, come on. Paul, you sure it's him? I'm so tired. Hi, girls. I go inside this apartment complex. Then there's this little, like, dog coming around the corner, peeking its head out at me. And I looked and I said, that's not my dog. I'm like, Boris is, you know, he's got beautiful eyes. He's got a tan fur jacket, you know, coat. He's beautiful. I said, this dog's skinny, and look at him. Oh, Boris. Barbara, look yeah. at him. And I said, Barbara, please, just look again. And I'm like, Boris? Boris, is that you? And then he looks up, his one ear up and one ear down. And I just was, I was like, oh. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. I'm shaking all over. And my legs gave out. I'm crying. Boris is looking at my face. I'm looking at everybody else in the room is crying. I love you. I can't believe you guys found It was the most beautiful thing. It was worth every minute of whatever I contributed as a part of this bigger picture. It was the best reward and most miraculous reward. That was a miracle. It was a chance in a billion. I don't believe it's you. Oh, I know you're so tired and scared. Oh, my God. Oh, look at his face, baby. OK, Boris, the moment we've been waiting for. That night, Barbara kept her promise. After weeks of waiting, her Christmas tree was finally lit to welcome Boris home. We'll make it all better. Yeah, look at the pretty tree. We can finally learn it because you're home. You're home, baby. Mm. The next morning, a triumphant New York Post headline greeted all of New York City, and magic, Boris immediately home. became a media darling. But after six weeks of street life, the mixed breed boxer is finally home. He's a trooper. He's, he's, he held in there. I can't believe it. All the while, his owner kept the faith. But it was a little magic that brought him home. And Paula Forrester helped provide some of that magic. She and Barbara continue to be close friends. And today, Barbara is far less skeptical of psychic phenomena. Wonderful, good boy. He just like sitting on you, huh? <laughs> OK, I'm a believer. There, there are some powers out there that you, know, you can't dismiss. Oh, boy. Our chances, psychically or otherwise, were one in a billion. I could have been totally wrong through this whole thing. It was a miracle that Boris was found. To find a lost dog in New York City, anything could happen, anything. For me to be reunited with him is total, total a miracle to me, totally.
Boris and Barbara's story didn't end with their reunion. They decided to share their miracle with other pets, and we thought you might be interested in learning what they did. So, they join us now from Manhattan. Hello there, how are you doing? Fine, thanks, Richard, how are you? I'm great, and it's a pleasure to meet both of you. Thank you for having us on your show. We really appreciate it. I understand that Boris went through a long period of recovery. Yes, unfortunately, it was miraculous that I did find Boris, but it took a year of, of, of recuperation and four major surgeries to get him back into shape. And during that time, you discovered that Boris wasn't the only pet to have suffered during a flight, and it changed your life? Richard, when I found out that 5,000 animals a year are being hurt, lost, or killed. I knew I had to do something about it. I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through. And what did you do? I actually got a bill passed, the Safe Air Travels for Animals Act, which is now known as the Boris Bill. <laughs> I'm very proud to announce that Bill Clinton signed it in April, so there are new regulations for when animals travel by air now. And what exactly does the Boris Bill cover? The Boris Bill is now a law that requires airlines to report how many animals are hurt, lost, or killed annually. Also, the reports have to be made available to consumers so that they, they know which airlines have safer records. Also, the liability has been doubled. What for you is the most important part of the bill? The most important aspect of the Boris Bill is that now they're, con they're actually acknowledging that animals are not luggage, that they are reporting them as live animals. Uh, my, my baby, he, look at him, he's so precious. He's not, he's not luggage. And it's ridiculous and times are changing where, you know, pets are now part of the family member. So it really is changing the ways of the future for animal rights and airlines. Well, congratulations on a job well done. Thank you, Richard, I really appreciate that. Good night. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. You've probably heard this saying, it's not the gift, it's the thought that counts, or big gifts come in small packages. Well, sometimes a gift can be as small as a kind word and a reassuring gesture. In the case of our next story, the gift of love and understanding was also as big as a miracle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son. In the winter of 1976, Robin Jansen began attending a new church in Ottawa, Illinois, where she immediately caught the eye of associate pastor Rick Shope. I noticed this young lady coming into the church, sitting towards the back, very good looking. Has given us the strength. Rick caught Robin's eye as well. He was very handsome. And I just thought, oh, well, I don't have a chance, and I'm not going to go up and talk to him first. I'm just going to sit back and just wait and see. Excuse me. Yes. Oh. I had a couple of my spies in the church find out who she was. Oh, that's Robin. You haven't met Robin before? No, no, I haven't. There were other girls in the church. There were some girls that liked me, but I was not drawn towards them. That concludes our ceremony for today. Robin we'll soon be became a regular parishioner, but continued to hide her feelings from the young minister. I would hang around the pews after church, hoping that he'd stop by and say a few words to me. Go in peace. Although I was very, very attracted to him and felt that I was falling in love with him, I had no idea how he felt about me. When I got up my courage, Hi. I asked her if she would like to go out with me. Good. Are you going to go to the fellowship meeting? Yeah, I was heading there just now. And we were going to go to a religious activity. So we had a sort of formal, informal first date, but it was still church related. But Robin was hesitant to pursue a relationship. Her mother was battling terminal cancer, and Robin was spending more and more time with her. My mother lived in Delavan, Wisconsin, and many times I would leave Illinois and just drive the 100 miles to be with her, help take care of her, and we became very, very close. It's time for you to go. Thanks. She was very ill. It was very hard for me to see her going downhill with the cancer. Robin was a devoted daughter, willing to sacrifice her own happiness in order to make her mother's life more comfortable. 
I'm fine, thank you. Concluding our service today, we remember the good days. And then one Sunday, her mother felt well enough to make the 100-mile trip to Robin's church. And Rick preached, and mother seemed to enjoy his sermon very much. And she said, oh my, he certainly preaches well for someone so young. Hi, Rick, I'd like you to meet my mother. Oh, that was an inspiring sermon. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you very I told much. Rick at the time that my mother was very sick with cancer. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I will pray for you. Oh, that, that would mean a lot to me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Unfortunately, her mother's condition took a sudden turn for the worse and she required full-time care. Finally, I made up my mind that I was just going to quit my job and move back to Wisconsin to take care of her. With her decision to move, Rick and Robin's budding relationship was coming to an end. Rick was just the type of person that I had always hoped and prayed for, but my mother needed me, and she came first. No matter what I felt for Rick, it just couldn't be and I went home as quickly as I could. When Robin arrived home, she found that her mother was dying. How am I gonna let you go, Mom? You've always been there for me. And my first broken heart, and when I didn't get chosen for the school play, and all the stories I would tell you, and you'd always listen. How can I not talk to you every day? Robin, it's time for me to go. Don't hold me here. No, it's going to be all right. She put her arms around me and kissed me and told me that everything was going to be all right and that everything was going to turn out all right for me. I'll just wait to see. I felt like in her death, she comforted me. It was Robin's last conversation with her mother. She had no way of knowing how prophetic their final words would be. That same night, Rick was alone praying when a man entered the church and approached him. Excuse me. Yes. yes. I couldn't help but notice you being deep in prayer. You're trying to make a decision about a girl, whether you should marry her or not. You've met her. You will live a long and happy life together. God bless you. It was a situation he could know nothing about. God bless you. I had never met the man before, nor have I seen him since. But I knew that Robin was the answer to my prayer. I was pleased, I was thankful, and in a sense excited too, and then nervous too. Rick soon learned the tragic news of Robin's mother's death. Oh, I'm so happy that I got you. I have some sad news. Robin's mother passed away. Two days later in Wisconsin, after her mother's funeral, Robin sat alone, consumed by her loss. What now for me, God? I didn't know how I was going to manage without my very best friend, without my mom. I felt devastated. And all of a sudden, Rick came and sat down beside me. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. Didn't you know I would come? No. And he held out his hand, and he said, Will you marry me? <laughs> what? And I went from devastation <laughs> to utter ecstasy in just a few seconds. I will. <laughs> and there was such a release of emotions that I just couldn't help but start to laugh. and cry for happiness and laugh and cry. And everything. <laughs> My mother had a wonderful laugh. She always saw the bright and sunny side of everything. And I know that she was laughing and rejoicing along with me. Six weeks later, on June 28, 1977, Robin and Rick became man and wife. The two recently celebrated their 22nd wedding anniversary. They have two children. I believe our marriage is a miracle. I believe that I was born for her, she was born for me. And there were two other people who played their part in bringing the young couple together. It's going to be all right for you. Robin's mother, who assured her on her deathbed that everything would be all right. And 100 miles away, 
a stranger Excuse who delivered me. Rick a mysterious message. I couldn't help but notice you being deep in prayer. He just looked at me and I said, you. you have been praying concerning a wife. Whether you should marry her or not. I met him only that night, and it was divine intervention. You will live a long and happy life together. It was a confirmation of my prayer, what I'd been praying for. I'm so happy to see you. And two days later, Robin's prayers were answered as well. Will you marry me? I will. Only God could have put everything together like that. Only God could take away the sorrow and pour in the joy. Mother had always taken care of me so well all my life. And this was her last gift to me. I'm so happy. This was her last time taking care of me here on Earth. It's common knowledge that animals have heightened senses. They can see farther, hear higher registers, and pick up a scent from miles away. But do they possess a sixth sense? Well, I know one young woman who would be the first to give you an emphatic yes, and this is why. If it wasn't for the courageous, even miraculous act of a yellow Labrador oh, retriever here. named Norman, Lisa Nibley might not be alive today. Now well, we have two dogs. In 1993, Annette McDonald of Seaside, Oregon, rescued Norman from an animal shelter when he was just a year old. Abandoned by his original owners, he had already been held two days longer than usual and was scheduled to be put to sleep the very next morning. But Annette sensed there was something special about the dog. I knew I wanted to get Norman right away. You want to go home with me? Huh? Norman started barking at us like he knew he was supposed to go with us. He was just coming unglued. Not long after Annette brought Norman home, she realized that something was terribly wrong with him. He's bumping into things during the daytime now. And he's Norman was losing his eyesight. The veterinarian diagnosed his problem as retinal atrophy. There was no cure permanent problem, it's going to eventually lead to blindness. Within months, Norman lost his sight completely. Norman. Bring it. Bring the stick. But Norman took his blindness in stride. Norman was able to adjust his eyesight really well. Norman, Norman, come, come here. He was still the same happy, enthusiastic dog that everybody loved. The blindness limited Norman's mobility, but on the open beach near the McDonald's home, he could still run free. The nearby Nicanicum River is a tidal estuary. Its outlet to the Pacific is a trickle at low tide, but when the tide comes in, it fills up like a bay. In July of 1996, 15-year-old Lisa Nibley and her younger brother Joe arrived on vacation. They had visited this beach every summer for the past three years. Both were excellent swimmers, and their parents trusted they could handle themselves in the waters. But today, the tide was changing, and as the cold ocean water rushed upstream, Lisa and Joe found themselves pulled into deeper and deeper water. A current started to form, and it um, got deeper, and I remember I got pushed away from my brother, and all of a sudden it dropped off, and the river got deep, and I couldn't touch the bottom. No, I can't touch anymore. Their playful shouts soon turned to screams of terror, cries that no one could possibly hear. It started to pull me under, and I was swimming against the current to get back, and I got really tired, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs. Joe made it to safety on the opposite shore and watched helplessly as a powerful current carried Lisa upstream. Me. I kept going under and then I'd get back up and I'd scream and um, I remember actually I did say a prayer to, to God when I was, I said, please don't let this happen to me. Meanwhile, Annette McDonald was bringing Norman down to the beach from her nearby home but it was very unusual for Annette to be there at that time of day. It was Monday morning and I didn't want to go to work, so my husband Steve told me to stay home and 
I was just about ready to sit down and read a book, and for some reason I looked at Norman and said, hello, let's go for a walk. All of a sudden, he cocked his head and started barreling down the beach, and I'd never seen him run like that before. The blind dog raced over 150 yards down the beach. Over the roar of the water, he had heard something that no human ear could detect. Guiding on Lisa's voice, Norman fearlessly paddled straight toward the drowning girl. I know some sw swimming to me. I realize that everything's gonna be okay. I'm, I'm gonna be all right. But when she stopped screaming, Norman lost his bearings. By now, Lisa's strength was gone and she began to be swept away. I started hyperventilating. I wasn't breathing well and I got really weak. From the shore, Annette desperately yelled out to her, telling her to call Norman's name. Norman didn't stop until he reached the voice. Lisa managed to grab onto him and he towed her back toward the sound of Annette's voice and safety. When Lisa came out of the water, I just hugged her and wanted her to know that she was safe. And she, she was trying to be so brave and she just said, you must be my guardian angel. And I said, no, Norman's your guardian angel. News of his heroics traveled quickly. People magazine put Lisa and Norman on their cover. Oh, that was good. But to those close to him, Norman is much more than just a hero. Miraculously, his blindness did not prevent him from saving a drowning girl. I knew that he was my guardian angel, that someone had sent him to save me. It really was a miracle how it all came together. I think maybe God does that to get your attention and maybe to humble us a little. For Lisa, the experience prompted her to express her feelings in song. No, they cannot see me. I feel as if they know me. I think I take things more seriously now. I don't just let things fly by. I just know that my life is important because if it wasn't, I wouldn't be here. And I owe my life to you. For me, the holidays are always much more fun when there are children around. It's the look on their faces when they see the presents under the tree or when you tell them the story of Santa and his reindeer. They're always so full of wide-eyed wonder. Perhaps it's because they're able to see things that we as adults often overlook. The little boy in our next story has that ability. And now it's our turn to watch in wide-eyed wonder. In 1988, Jeffrey and Cheryl Hare had their first child, a boy. They named him Ryan in honor of another very special young man. I had had an adopted type brother named Ryan also, I and mean, he had died of cancer when he was 18. So that name was a very special name to us, so we didn't even consider another name for him. For five years, Ryan grew and developed like any normal child. And then in March 1994, he came down with the chicken pox. At first, his mother wasn't overly concerned about this common childhood illness. But then suddenly, she realized that something was terribly wrong. Ryan's fever had soared to 106, and the red spots on his neck had begun to swell. He was immediately rushed to a local hospital and put under the care of Dr. Diane Foley. Ryan was critically ill. There was infection underneath the skin of his whole body. It actually spread all the way around his neck. And at that point, when there's swelling, what you worry about in your neck is that it will affect your airway and you won't be able to breathe. The physicians told us that they were doing everything they could. They put him on all of the drugs. They told us that we should see 
um, some response within 24 to 48 hours. But two days later, Ryan was getting worse, not better. The infection was spreading to all parts of his body, but in addition, his neck was being held at a very unusual, difficult position, twisting so much the doctors were very concerned that it would actually um, snap his spinal cord. After almost two weeks of trying everything to save Ryan's life, the doctors told his parents there was nothing more they could do. Our whole mission in life is to heal. And it's very difficult to be in a situation where you have to admit you can't do that. When the doctors came and told us that there wasn't any more that they could do, it was kind of a helpless feeling, kind of a, a wow, we're in this alone. I was very scared when they told us nothing more could be done. I, I really believed that Ryan might die. That was probably the first time it really sunk in. But Cheryl refused to give up hope. I turned away from all the medical things that I knew and turned straight to my faith. She read a story about how angels are always nearby, ready to guard us in our times of need. And then she quietly asked them to come to the rescue of her dying son. Please, Lord, we need you to help us. And I asked specifically, I'm not sure why, except that there were four empty corners in the room for four angels just to sit up in the corners and to watch over my son. The next day, while his father Jeffrey kept vigil by his son's side, Ryan's condition dramatically improved. It kind of stunned me. I, I was surprised that he was even moving um, and to see him up on his hands and knees and appearing as though he wasn't in any pain, um, it shocked me. I couldn't believe that it could be such a night and day situation where he felt so much better. Twelve days later, the boy who doctors had said might die was going home, and that's when he told his mother his own amazing story about the angels who had visited him in his room. They kind of just standed there covering the corners that my mom told them to cover, guarding me to make sure I was okay. They were real, real nice. They just said that Ryan said hi. Could the angels have been talking about Cheryl's dead brother? Could he have played a part in Ryan's miraculous recovery? That really shocked me because we had not discussed very much with my son about him being named after my brother, Ryan. Today, Ryan has fully recovered, and his family has little doubt of the cure. Even Dr. Foley is amazed. I believe that medical science had exhausted all of their abilities, and I believe that it was only a miracle that Ryan got better. I don't doubt that the angels came in. His recovery was so quick after he saw the angels, and I just believe it was a miracle. Can a love be so strong that it transcends time and space, and even death? To answer that question, you only have to look at the lives of two lonely people, brought together by what they believe was a heavenly vision. This is their story, and it's up to you to decide whether it was just a dream or a miracle. The personal ads. They contain thousands of stories of lonely people looking for love, and at least one story that could be a miracle. It all began in 1973 with a dream, a vision of a mysterious red-haired lady seated at a church organ. I want you to place a personal ad, and this is what I wanted to say. The dreamer was Chris Henry, a young woman living in St. Petersburg, Florida. Although the words of the woman in the dream made no sense, Chris was compelled to write them down. The next day, Chris's employer found the note and asked Chris about it. And she said, she came out and she said, what's this? I said, it was just a dream of this lady. She was telling me to write this ad and to put it into a, pu uh, publish it into a, a paper. And uh, I said, just leave it next to my bed. It's just a dream, don't worry with it. 
But Chris's boss took matters into her own hands and sent the note to the local classifieds. A few nights later, the persistent figure returned to Chris's dreams. This time, her message was even more specific. Respond only to the typewritten letter. The next day, Chris told her boss about the second encounter. I said, guess what? I had another dream about that pretty lady with the red hair in front of the organ. She told me to only respond to the typewritten letter. And Doris started laughing because she said, well, I put it in publication. Two weeks later, a large envelope arrived with over 65 responses to the personal ad. To Chris's amazement, there was only one typewritten letter. It was from Jim Kelly. I actually wrote it out first, and then I typed it. I figured, well, it'll look more professional. And, uh, uh, those type columns, you're a little leery anyway. If it comes in as a type letter, uh, possibility you have a chance, you know, uh, that person will talk to you. And that's what I did. After several telephone conversations, Chris and Jim finally made a date to go dancing. When I first saw her, you know, it was just, she was so beautiful. And uh, I said, well, <laughs> this will be a one shot date. Because, you know, I said, I'm not going to be able to compete with this. When I saw him, he was the most romantic looking man I'd ever seen in my life. There was something there, it was almost like a spiritual connection because uh, everything just clicked almost like a soulmate type situation. You'd found somebody you were very attracted to. If he would have said, do you want to marry me? I'd say yes, right then and there. And that's how I felt. Chris and Jim fell deeply in love and were married three years later. The newlywed couple was very aware that a miraculous sequence of events had brought them together. But there is one more incredible event in their story. While visiting Jim's mother, Chris paged through a family album when she noticed a photograph that took her breath away. There was the woman with the red hair looking right at me, and I said, that's her. That's the lady in my dream. She's the one that told me what to say. Another photograph showed the same woman standing next to Jim. Chris was shocked and asked Jim who she was. Chris had mentioned, she says, well, that's the lady that was in my dream. And, uh, You know, I became real emotional about it. As I said, that's, you know, that's my wife died of cancer. Unknown to Chris, Jim's first wife, Georgia, had lost a difficult battle with cancer, and Jim had been silently mourning her loss. Chris's dream when she had mentioned that she saw the woman sitting in Oregon. That was kind of a confirmation for me in my own thoughts because uh, Georgia uh, used to play in church organ. Chris felt an immediate connection to Jim's deceased wife. The love that I had for this woman, it was an honor to be directed and led by her and to be picked by her to be with Jim. Both Jim and Chris were convinced that her dreams were a message of love and proof that miracles do happen. I think this happened because Georgia basically wanted me to continue on in a relationship and not just wander in the desert like the nomads. I guess she knew that I would be his best friend. I would take care of him and make sure that he was loved and that's all he would ever know. This story definitely as a miracle itself it demonstrates that you know love goes beyond the grave it still continues her influence has been there with us all these years uh, they had a very special marriage and to know that i'm i'm handpicked by spirit you can't get better than that Mysterious visions, unexplained interventions, twists of fate that positively change an outcome of a human life. Some might call these miracles. And what you're about to see is one of these amazing stories. I was walking home from school on a 
cold winter day. The song Angels Among Us, performed by the renowned group the Alabama, is a moving tribute to the power of miracles. But the story behind the writing of this song is a miracle in itself. Songwriter Becky Hobbs had composed hits for stars like Conway Twitty, Emmylou Harris, and Glen Campbell. In 1994, Cashbox magazine named her Independent Country Music Female Artist of the Year. Her biggest dream came true when Alabama took Angels Among Us to the top of the charts for over a year. But that dream began with a nightmare. I started having premonitions that I was going to be in a bad vehicle accident. And this would happen to me shortly before I'd fall asleep. You know, when you lay down and you're getting ready to go to sleep and you're sort of drifting into a dream, I'd sit up in bed and I'd be sweating, my heart would be pounding, and I would have a feeling of despair. Becky didn't realize that her nightmare was just the first of two powerful premonitions. The second would occur a few weeks later while preparing a cake for her birthday. I was stirring the batter and something took a hold of my elbow and pulled me out through my hallway out into my front yard. It was a feeling like you don't question this. You go out in your front yard. I knew there was something I needed to know. I didn't hear a voice at that point, and there was this force, and I followed it. And I just went, what are you trying to tell me? This loud, masculine voice said, this may be your last birthday. And I'm thinking, may. The key word is may. This may be your last birthday. This is something I can prevent if I'm careful. Becky didn't have to wait long to act on her instinct. Her premonitions came yeah, true the very on. next day as she and her band returned to Nashville from a benefit concert. We were stopped at a four-way intersection, and I looked out the window of the van. There was an 18-wheeler just barreling towards the intersection. Her nightmare returned in a flash. I got that same sick feeling that I had had in the premonitions. My heart started pounding. At that moment, I felt our driver's foot lift off the brake, and we started moving forward. Becky screamed, and the driver swerved the vehicle. A second later, and everyone in the van would have been killed. But miraculously, they all walked away. In time, Becky realized her life had been spared for a reason. It all happened so fast, but it was later that I put the pieces together. Sometime after the accident, I wrote down the title, I Believe There Are Angels Among Us, in my notebook. I started working on it, and I had a melody happening, and I had the first line of the chorus, and I had pretty much the, the sketch of the chorus. Sometimes when you're writing a song, you're rocking and you feel like you're on top of the world. And you feel like, yeah, I like this. This song was more like we were in awe of what was happening. We were humbled and I felt very small when I was writing it. I felt like it was a gift and that I was fortunate to just be one of the channels for the gift. Someone lights the way with just a single ray of hope. Becky Hobbs looks back at her premonitions and near-fatal accident with a miraculous sense of purpose. I do think that one of the reasons why I'm still here is so I could write the song Angels Among Us because the song has given so many people so much and has given me more than I ever dreamed uh, anything could give me. It has just been a truly a blessing in my life. At this time of year, angels seem to turn up everywhere. They're constant reminders of the miracles of this holiday season. But angels can appear whenever and wherever they're needed, and our next story proves it.
On October 24, 1997, college junior Brett Odom, his girlfriend Mary Wallace, and his cat Jasmine set off for a camping trip in the Smoky Mountains. We had had a very busy week and we had planned a sort of a vacation. We were meeting my parents and some of our church friends at a campsite. We were just really excited. Um, just and we were talking about the whole weekend and you know what I, what I could look forward to and campfires and singing songs. As we got closer, we realized that there was a shorter way to go, and so doing? we took that road because of the map. I was following pretty close behind a white minivan. Brett continued to follow the van's lights along the narrow, twisting road. I turned around to see how the cat was doing in the back seat. When I turned back around, I saw the taillights of a minivan disappear around a curve. But there wasn't time for Brett to make the turn himself, and his truck plunged over the embankment into a creek below. At the same moment, miles away at their campsite, Brett's mother, Janice, was experiencing a bizarre physical reaction. I began to feel this heat sensation, and it was very strange. And when I looked down, my right hand was a sky blue, and I thought, I'm having a heart attack. But as quickly as the sensations began, they disappeared. The experience left Janice with the need to cling to her younger son, as if he might be all that she had left. Her husband, Dr. Alan Odom, sensed that something was wrong. What's the matter? I don't know. I think we better go look for Brett and Mary. Janice had a very uneasy feeling. Uh, in that uh, and she's a very discerning individual and she thought that we ought to go look for Brett since he was late. Janice Odom's premonition could not have been more accurate. Even now, her son's truck lay partially underwater at the bottom of a steep ravine. Mary was still alive, but terrified. As I was panicking and thinking that I was going to die, I heard a voice and I saw a man standing next to me. And he said, you're not going to die right now. Someone needs your help. That is when I suddenly became aware of the fact that Brett was underwater. Once she realized that I was underwater and couldn't do anything, she would pick me back up and, and try and keep my head lifted up on her knees up out of the water so that I could breathe. Oh my god, don't leave me. Miraculously, the driver of the white minivan had seen the accident and immediately flagged down an approaching vehicle driven by an off-duty park ranger. By the time Brett's parents arrived on the scene, the rescue was well underway. There was a lot of activity. We saw the blue lights flashing. I said, well, someone's had a wreck or something. The Odoms soon learned that Mary and Brett had been pulled from the what car happened? and airlifted to a hospital near Knoxville, Tennessee. She said the boy's broken his neck, and the girl has a lot of injuries. The Odoms rushed to meet their son at the hospital. It was a moment that Dr. Odom will never forget. The feelings that I have as a physician were one of concern for the, for the patient that has a broken neck and broken back. The feelings that I have as a parent, as a father, were indescribable. Dr. Odom knew that his son needed a specialist, and so he contacted a friend, Dr. Hi, Scott Hodges, Alan. at a conference in New York. Brent's been in a terrible accident. I could detect the uh, stress in his voice, and I felt that I really needed to come home and at least be with him. He had a dismal prognosis for being able to ever walk again. The general consensus would have been that he was paralyzed and would remain that way for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, Dr. Hodges agreed to operate. Procedure involved a rather large incision through the chest. We uh, took away all of that bone that was compressing his spinal cord. Next, a bone taken from a cadaver was grafted onto Brett's damaged spinal column to hold it in place. Knowing the surgery might not be a success, the Odoms decided it was time to ask for a miracle. We're trying to get hold of, of some oh, people thanks. and we want to thank you very much. Out. We have had people literally praying for us all over the world. This person would tell that person, that person would tell this person. And um, you'll hear my husband tell you that he felt like it was like a steam locomotive. And the locomotive picked up speed and it just kept going and kept going and kept going and just charged right by us. 
After the long hours of surgery, Janice and Alan finally got to see their son. How you feeling, honey? I felt better. What's the matter? My skin kind of hurts. You can feel her touch you? Uh-huh. Can you feel this? Uh-huh. He had sensation in his hands and his arms and his feet. So there was potential there. The fact that he did have a broken neck and broken back, though, is a very serious, that's a very serious injury. Weeks after recovering from her own injuries, Mary was able to visit Brett. It was a very emotional moment. I was really afraid that he was going to reject me because of the way I looked. He just gave me the biggest grin, and I felt some of the nervousness just kind of melt away. I climbed up on his bed and I laid next to him and it was just, it was really hard to do because neither one of us knew what kind of future he faced. I was afraid that if he was going to be paralyzed, that he was going to be angry at me for saving him when perhaps he would have rather died. At that point in time, there was, there was no thought to anything beyond the present situation. It was a massive effort to make it minute to minute. Over the next two months, Brett worked constantly in physical therapy to try to reclaim some of his motor skills. I went from just being able to flinch muscles at first to actually being able to lift my arm to being able to sit up in a chair. Once we got to that point, my Recovery was moving very, very rapidly, and I was convinced that if there was a miracle to be had, and if it was God's will, I was going to walk out of the hospital. And 63 days later, Brett's miracle became a reality. God showed us very small miracles each day, which added into what the one big miracle that Brett was able to walk out of the spinal cord unit. The dramatic events surrounding Brett Odom's near-fatal accident contain all the elements of a miracle. From his mother's premonition that her son had been injured to the strange voice that told his girlfriend she had lived to save his life, the mysteries of that night point to a higher power watching over Brett Odom's life. I think one of the greatest things about this accident, if, if there can be anything great that comes out of it, it is the opportunity to uh, share with other people just um, how great God really is. God has made it very clear to me that bad things do happen to good people, and that doesn't mean that God's an ogre and inflicts pain on people. It means that it's part of His greater plan, and that if we can keep our eyes on Him, we'll stay in His hand, and He will direct our paths. Changing their lives forever, it's a miracle. That's our show for tonight. We hope you enjoyed this special holiday edition. It's the season for miracles, and we'll be bringing you many more in the weeks to come. I hope you'll join us next time. Until then, happy holidays. Good night. <laughs>